Hello to everybody. I'm Mel Chaskin, the chairman of the board of the Center for Excellence Education. So my privilege to host this with you all and our board of directors, who I'm proud of being on. And in a little while, you'll see some of the members there and pictures of them. This is a unique time for us all, and we appreciate the opportunity to continue having our congressional breakfasts and, and luncheons that you have. And we will continue doing them, and our programs will continue going forward. Now I'd like to see a, a short presentation of who our board members are, followed by an introduction of our, our, our president will take over. Welcome to the center's annual congressional luncheon event, minus the lunch. Some of you are probably happy to forego another menu of chicken, salmon, and salad. Let us have an enjoyable and inform informative virtual celebration. I am Joanne DeGennaro, president of the Center for Excellence in Education which I co-founded 36 years ago with the late Admiral H.G. Rickover to nurture high school and university scholars to excellence and leadership in science, technology, engineering, and math, and to encourage STEM collaboration in the global community. Nearly 300 guests registered for this celebration, which brings together representatives from corporations, organizations, universities, the US government, alumni of our programs, parents and individuals who support the center's objectives. Because of individuals like you, the center can sponsor all its programs to students and teachers without a fee, thereby leveling the playing field for less economically advantaged students. Today, we have a fun part of our celebration, and I hope technologically there will be no difficulties. We're going to have trivia, a trivia game, and see what you know about Admiral Rickover. An email is being sent to you now. It must be returned by 1230, the cutoff time, and you return it by pressing the button. And our trivia coordinator, Kent Churchill will come on later to moderate this whole procedure. Kent's an RSI 84, the first program, a Naval Academy graduate, the last interviewee of Admiral Rickover to go to the Naval Academy. And he will be back with us after Dr. McQuaid speaks with alumni. All right, let's go on and begin the program, which I know you're going to enjoy. Clarin Nardi Riddle, take it away. Thank you so much, Joanne. It's a pleasure to be with everyone this afternoon. I am also a trustee of the Center for Excellence in Education. I was once an honors mathematics major before I decided to solve problems and puzzles in the law. And I was able to be attorney general of Connecticut, a judge in Connecticut, and a chief of staff for Senator Joe Lieberman. And now I head up a government affairs practice at the Kasowitz Law Firm. It's my true pleasure today to introduce 
are three honorary trustee members of Congress. Today, Senator Lindsey Graham cannot be with us, but we have Senator Rosen, Representative Dunn, and Representative Peters. So let me give you a brief introduction about their distinguished careers. Before being elected to the Senate in 2018, Senator Rosen represented Nevada's third district in the 115th Congress. She served in the House on the House Armed Services Committee and the House Science, Space and Technology Committee, where she passed bipartisan legislation through the House to improve early childhood STEM education. In the Senate, she's a member of the Senate Health, Education, Labor and Pensions Committee, Commerce Committee, Small Business Committee, Committee on Aging, and Homeland Security and Government Affairs. And she's also a proud member of the Nevada Women in STEM. We're very proud to have Senator Rosen as an honorary um, trustee. Our second member is Dr. Neil Dunn. He's from Florida's second district, grew up in an army family, and was stationed at over 20 places before college, including in Vietnam during middle school. Dr. Dunn was a surgeon in Panama City for 25 years and was the founding president of the Advanced Urology Institute, a 45 physician practice with over 400 employees. He also founded the Bay Regional Cancer Center and pursued a special interest in advanced prostate cancer. He's in his second term in Congress and he serves on the House Committee on Veterans Affairs, House Committee on Agriculture, and the Doctors' Caucus. Again, we're very proud to have Dr. Congressman Dunn as an honorary trustee. And last but not least, Congressman Scott Peters, who serves California's 52nd Congressional District, which includes the cities of Coronado and most of Northern San Diego. He was first elected in 2012. He currently serves on the House Committee on the Budget and the House Energy and Commerce Committee, where he advocates for investment in basic scientific research and supports the military's goals to enhance their energy security. During his time in Congress, Congressman Peters has passed legislation to give the military the advanced technology it needs to fight terrorism. His emphasis has been on promoting and expanding San Diego's innovation ecosystem, advocating for San Diego's pivotal role as a partner in the national defense, and making government work again. Again, CEE is very proud to have Congressman Peters as an honorary CEE trustee. So let's now all listen to Senator Rosen, Congressman Dunn, and Congressman Peters. Hi, I'm Senator Jackie Rosen. I'm sorry we can't be there together in person today, but I want to thank the Center for Excellence in Education for supporting our students and helping them realize and reach their potential. You are creating the next generation of American scientists, engineers, inventors, and leaders. I'm proud to say that several Nevadans have been recognized or received CEE awards over the past several years, and I'm honored to serve as an honorary board member of CEE. Across the country, we're seeing a huge demand for workers in STEM fields, with software developers, mathematicians, and health aides among the fastest growing occupations. The most important investment we can always make is in our children's education. That's why I'm proud to have introduced the Building Blocks of STEM Act, a bipartisan bill that is now law, which heavily invests in STEM education for our students. Thank you again for supporting our future generations of scientists, engineers, coders, and leaders. I wish you and your team all the best, and I want you to know that you have a partner here on Capitol Hill. Thank you. Hi, this is Congressman Neil Dunn, and I'm, and I'm here today to talk to you about why STEM and education is important for our future generation. America has a clear and unmet need for more STEM education. Learning history is also important, as is English composition, which is informed by studying literature. But without a strong presence of leaders well-educated in STEM fields, in addition to these other subjects, 
we place our future in great peril. A STEM education teaches our future generation how to evaluate information. These days we find ourselves confronted with mountains of information, but this information needs to be examined in a knowledgeable way before we accept it as evidence. All too often, more sound bites are offered as evidence, but they're not evidence. This is critical when our leaders are faced with making decisions about issues that impact our nation and the entire world. Given our current pandemic caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we are seeing more clearly than ever the need for leadership that is informed by solid STEM education. We need informed scientists and healthcare professionals in our decision-making processes now more than ever. We also need our citizens to be critical thinkers about subjects they generally give no thought to at all. They need to understand how and why we should adapt to the new realities we're facing. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor, occupations in STEM fields are projected to grow by more than 9 million jobs by 2022. Last month, President Trump signed into law a bill I wrote that instructs the National Science Foundation to develop an outreach plan to connect veterans separating from active duty with civilian jobs and educational opportunities that are natural matches to their military education in the STEM fields. H.R. 425, the Supporting Veterans in STEM Careers Act, will ensure that the skills that a majority of our veterans already have, they already learn them during their service to our nation, are put to good use for decades to come as they successfully transition to civilian life. I commend you all for your work in this field, and I ask you very much to carry on. Hi, I'm Congressman Scott Peters, and I represent San Diego, Coronado, and Poway in the United States Congress. I'm pleased to join you today virtually. I've spoken at the center's lunches uh, from time to time, and I'm excited about the work you do. I'm pleased to be able to join you uh, in this uh, coronavirus way. You know, it's been a hard year for everybody. We've been um, really had to change our whole lives. We've been scared about the health crisis. We've, we've tried to, we're trying to weather this economic crisis as well, but we've never been more reminded, uh, have we been, than about the importance of uh, science and technology here, because what we're talking, what are we talking about? We're talking about a vaccine to prevent, prevent to prevent this from happening again. We're talking about trying to test antibodies for therapies and cures. We're trying to talk about what tests could help us with diagnosis. Um, fundamentally, it's science that's going to help us understand this problem, and it's science that's going to get us out of this uh, this problem at the end. And science is a cornerstone of what happens in San Diego, and as a consequence of what I do in, in Congress. So. San Diego, I, lo I love living in San Diego. We're, we're lucky to be buoyed by a few economies. We're clearly a tourist economy. We'd love you to come visit uh, when things get better. We have a great border, which generates a lot of trade with Mexico. Uh, we, we are very proud to be a military town. About 20% of our jobs are military jobs. Uh, and we're very conscious that um, we're partners in the national defense, but, we're, but that's a big economic investment for us. But Perhaps no, no economy, no sector is as important to San Diego as science and technology. So, you know, we're the home of Qualcomm, so we're big in telecommunications, but we're also one of the leading hubs for life sciences and biotechnologies. Um, that may have started with uh, Jonas Salk with the Salk Institute uh, a few decades ago when he established his institution up in the Mesa in La Jolla, but that's uh, there's also a joined uh, on, the, on the Mesa by places like Scripps Research, like Sanford Burnham Prebis Cancer, like the La Jolla Institute of Immunology, UCSD, which has taken off. Um, all of those uh, are, are powerful generators of new science and exciting science that, that's going to help solve problems. A really important component of that is the federal investment that you and I make through our tax dollars. So. We set aside certain money, say through the National Institutes of Health, for scientists to compete for grants to do this science. And imagine this, you're a scientist, uh, you've got an idea for some basic research that you wanna do. You've gotta put in a grant, you've gotta compete against all the other best scientists in the whole country. And in good times, only about 20% of those grants will be funded. Uh, so that means it's scientific, and it's peer reviewed. Scientists decide who, who gets the money, not the politicians. 
So that means that the people who are doing that work um, are doing the highest level science in the world. And what does that mean? It means, it's, it means discovery. It means we're gonna understand how the body works. We're gonna understand what medicines work, what new medicines could work, how one medicine might fit one person through things like personalized medicine. San Diego is the center of all that. And so that's formed my, um, my uh, service in Congress. One, I fought for increases in the National Institutes of Health uh, and other basic research budgets. And just since I've been in Congress, uh, the budget for NIH went from 29 billion to almost $40 billion. Um, obviously that's a team effort, but that's been a priority of mine. Another thing I wanna do is make sure that um, we support new technologies like genomics. So um, one of the big developers of uh, whole genome sequencing is a guy named Craig Venter. His institute is right here in La Jolla. Um, imagine that you could, you could diagnose your gene sequence and decide what medicines fit you. And we've already seen this has been tremendously helpful in diagnosing rare disease, things that vex doctors for a long time and families cost a lot of money. Well, new technology can really help that. We wanna make sure that we get that kind of thing into new medicine. So that's why I joined the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, which governs healthcare as well as other matters in the economy. I wanna make sure that um, we're driven by science, that science uh, continues to prosper in San Diego and across the country. And finally, I just wanna put a, a word in for all the young people and for all the teachers who teach STEM courses, science, technology, engineering, and math. We have. We're only able to fill about half the engineering jobs we have with people who are educated here. So we really got to up that. So thanks for having me to your lunch uh, virtually. Thanks for all the work you do on things like the Biology Olympiad, the Research and Science Institute, the Teacher Enrichment Program. Uh, you've clearly made an investment in the next generation of scientists. Uh, we owe you for that. We owe you great thanks. And we wish you the very best of luck and you have a partner in me and my colleagues. Be well. The meat of our program today is with Michael McQuaid, a board member with our students. So Michael, take it away, please. Thanks, Joanne. And uh, thanks to the alumni who are gonna speak here in just a minute because sometimes when you have technical difficulties, it really makes it clear how much the people who follow are gonna shine. So the, the burden is gonna be on you and I have complete confidence in that. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael McQuay. I am the Vice President for Research at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, prior to that, I was the Chief Technology Officer for many years at United Technologies Corporation, and that's when my association with CEE began uh, because of some personal contacts in the company and because of the company's reliance on the kinds of students who grow out of CEE. So it was uh, labor of love that I have continued over this last decade or so. And I am delighted today to bring, uh, bring to, to you uh, the stories of four alumni from the RSI and USABO program. Um, I'm gonna give you a brief uh, sort of 10 seconds on each one, and then I'm gonna eat, introduce each of them a little bit more deliberately and give them a chance to speak. And then we'll open it up for some Q&A with all of them. So our four speakers today are uh, Rachel Sievers, who's uh, a recent RSI alum. Uh, she has uh, finished her first year at Harvard, and I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, her and each of them in just a moment. Our second uh, recent uh, USABO um, participant is Christopher Wang, who's now a rising college sophomore at Washington University. And then to help you uh, realize how much it gets in your blood and how much you never leave, we have three, uh, three longer term alumni from the program, both of which have highly successful careers. Um, Shamit Kashru is professor of physics and the chair of the physics department at Stanford. And Susan Koh, who is a trustee of the uh, Center for Excellence in Education. Um, uh, and she's gonna talk about her experience, uh, her, her experiences here uh, after her career graduating from Harvard and then on in the investment industry. So. Those are our four speakers. I think you can see them all, or at least I hope you can. And so now I'm gonna, first of all, um, give Rachel a chance to talk. So Rachel Sievers, as I said, has completed her first year at Harvard. Um, she's planning a degree in mechanical engineering. She began her work, uh, her journey with CEE when she participated in the 2018 Research Science Institute summer program. Um, so much so that she returned the following year 
um, as a counselor for the 2019 program. Um, she was chosen by her peers in the 2018 RSI program um, at the uh, regenerative, re, sorry, Regeneron Science Talent Search Final Competition. She received the 2019 Glenn T. Seaborg Award for her academics and personal demeanor. And she was also awarded uh, at the Intel Foundation Young Scientist Scholarship for $50,000 for her ongoing education from the Intel Science Fair. So, Rachel, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you talk just a little bit for everybody. Yes, thank you so much. And um, welcome, everyone, to this virtual yet no less inspiring and incredible event. Um, it would be a bit hypocritical of me not to acknowledge the context that has put us into this situation and to take a moment to thank all of the volunteers and people who made this event possible. So thank you. But I'd also like to take a moment to thank everyone in attendance here as well. We live in a time right now where every action, everything we do takes an immense amount of effort. And yet here we all are as a community coming together as one. And that's something that we've been hearing a lot about recently, uh, especially in this time of isolation, that idea of community. And yet that's something that's not necessarily new or novel. Um, in fact, the idea of teamwork, working together, that is something that is pivotal and fundamental for scientific research. And that, that idea of community, that's what CEE taught me. And that's what I will hold with me for the rest of my life. Um, when I say that I learned so much at RSI, both as being a Rickoid and as being a counselor, I don't necessarily mean that I learned facts and figures, although I did. <laughs> But what I mean is I learned what it meant to be part of something. And that's what RSI really stands for. And I have a quick anecdote, which I think really exemplifies that for everyone. Uh, when I was a counselor at RSI, my third week of the six week program, I actually ended up getting really sick. I um, developed a case of oral thrush, which made it intensely um, painful to eat, drink, even breathe. And I was in so much pain that my parents actually came up to Boston from Kentucky over 14 hours of a drive. And it would have been really easy for me to go back home. Um, but in the short time that I had been with my students, they made an incredible impact on me. And I got better for them. And when I went back to RSI, on my desk were dozens of these origami hearts that they all made for me that were get well soon cards. And the people that I was supposed to be caring for, they were caring for me. And that's something that is so important right now. I got better, but there are people out there that are the sickest they've ever been right now. And it's up to us as people who are part of the research community to not only, yes, create a vaccine, a cure, things like that, but to also share the most important thing about research, which is community with everyone. And I think that's what CEE does. So thank you. Thanks, Rachel. That's very good. Um, okay, Chris, Christopher, back to you. So Christopher Wang is a rising college sophomore studying neuroscience at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Um, he attended high school in Massachusetts and he competed in the 2018 USA Bio Biology Olympiad uh, and the 2019 International Biology Olympiad in Hungary, where he received a gold medal and the third highest score in the world. So Christopher, we're all honored to be in your presence. Um, at Washington, he currently works in a biology research lab, studying the effects of uh, circadian timing on glioblastoma chemotherapy. Um, remember, this is a rising sophomore. Um, in his free time, he enjoys singing, playing video games, and arranging music for the piano. Um, that leaves me a little breathless. Uh, so Christopher, I'm going to turn it over to you for some comments. Thank you so much, Michael, and thank you, Rachel, as well, for that um, for that inspiring inspiring speech. Um, I personally will say that I did not expect um, going into high school. Uh, I honestly didn't expect to to be studying biology. Um, that's not what I thought I would be interested in. Um, but I think what really sold it for me was that uh, I had a very good fr um, freshman biology teacher, um, and he was the one who recommended that I uh, that I. Uh, prepare for the the USA Biology Olympiad and, and take the exams. Um, he's also the Science Olympiad coach for our school's team, which is a very competitive team. So I he really got me into a lot of the kind of um, 
extracurricular biology stuff beyond just what the what the the classes teach. Um, so I did a lot of things in high school. I I enrolled in uh, some summer summer university courses with some labs. I participated in some summer research programs. Um, I studied a lot of things on my own, just on the internet. Um, and I know that you know where I am now, having been through the USA Biology Olympiad and meeting lots of people. I know that a lot of people. Uh, like to prepare for it by reading a lot of textbooks. And I think, um, and I'll admit that I was never one for, for reading uh, textbooks all the time. Um, but I think what really helped me do well and what um, really pushed me to, to kind of go as far as I did is that I, I really loved a lot of the experiences I had in, in high school, um, you know, working in labs, being immersed in that kind of stuff. I think I made the most of what I learned. Um, and, you know, it was kind of, it was kind of always like I wasn't doing it um, just to just to like memorize things, but because it was really interesting, um, and it was kind of just you know I was I was going through, and I'll admit that I never I never expected to to kind of succeed like go as far as um, you know reaching the the national finals or the international biology olympiad. But I was doing so many things in high school that um, when I reached my senior year, um, I you know I surprised myself. I I didn't have a lot of confidence um, in the fact that I was going to do so well, but um, I did, and when I made it to the to to the to the national finals, um, it was an amazing experience. And I think that thing about kind of immersing yourself in biology and making the most of um, your experiences um, is really what the national finals is all about. Because those were probably the the busiest, most action packed two weeks of my life. We were in the labs from you know eight a.m. to to 6 p.m. Um, doing tons of different protocols and experiments. Um, and after that, we would have several hours more where we kept learning stuff from the teaching assistants. And every all the time, every day was, it was exhausting, but it was also incredibly fulfilling. Um, and I will say that it was also definitely a roller coaster at times because there were a lot of times when I felt, um, I felt overwhelmed. We had so many things to do in lab, you know, you can't get them all right in the first try. And um, when lots of things inevitably went wrong, I, I there were points when I really doubted myself. Um, but I think what really um, made the experience amazing for everything was the fact that um, you have all these people um, you know, all these students who really love biology and uh, even when, you know, some of us are having trouble or when some of us don't know something, um, everyone else will, you know, support us, teach us. Uh, and I think that that coupled with all the things that we were learning just day in, day out, made those two weeks so incredibly memorable. And I think that they did an excellent job preparing us for the, the International Biology Olympiad. Um, and that was an experience that I enjoyed so much as well, just meeting so many people, hundreds of people from other countries. Um, and the, the competition was amazing. And I'm so thankful for the, the chance to, to participate. Thanks very much, Christopher. Um, uh, Susan Coe is a trustee of the Center for Excellence in Education. She's a 1991 alumnus, alumna of RSI. She serves on the executive board of the Harvard College Fund and Harvard's Committee on University Resources. Um, previously, she worked in private equity. She was an investment professional at the Carlyle Group. Uh, she invested in distressed securities at an affiliate of Ziff Brothers Investments. Um, she's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Business School. And uh, after living in Hong Kong for eight years, she's recently re relocated back to the Boston area with her husband and three children. So Susan, over to you. Thanks, Michael. Good, after, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, it's good to see so many old friends online. Um, my name is Susan Coe, and I attended RSI in 1991 at George Washington University in DC, and then was a counselor in 1992 at MIT. I graduated from Thomas Jefferson High School in Alexandria, Virginia, where longtime RSI director Dr. John Dell was my AP physics teacher. My interest in science has taken many twists and turns over the years, um, and I'm indebted to the center for introducing me to numerous opportunities in applied math and computer science, uh, mostly in non-academic settings. After my freshman year in college, I heard about an internship through CEE called the Director Summer Program at the National Security Agency, where I worked on problems that I really can't talk about today. Um, for another summer, I interned in private equity at the Carlisle Group through a contact on CEE's Board of Trustees. At the time, Carlisle was a small firm, less than 50 people, and private equity was a nascent industry. I discovered that 
principal investing was a passion, especially the opportunity to evaluate investment opportunities, meet management teams, and help businesses grow and transform. I was with Carlisle for over 10 years and then spent a year trading distressed debt the year after the mortgage crisis led to the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, which is still the largest bankruptcy filing in US history. Needless to say, it was quite a fruitful time to be investing in distressed securities. As I look back on my career and my personal life, I'm struck by how RSI and the center have figured so prominently. Of course, the center was an incredibly important professional resource for me to explore my interest in math and computer science. But the most important thing I've taken from my experience at RSI are the personal relationships with some of my closest friends and colleagues. There's just something special about being a Rickoid, and I've been awestruck by the willingness of so many alums to lend a hand. On a personal note, my father's currently battling cancer, and I'm so thankful for the many alums who reached out to offer not only their advice, but also contacts at cancer centers around the country. I would be remiss to mention that I'm so grateful that RSI was cost-free. It was the first summer program that I was able to attend because my parents did not have the financial resources to send me to other camps. Today, I'm deeply honored to serve on CEE's Board of Trustees, where my focus the past year and a half has been to build the endowment so that RSI and other CEE programs will remain cost-free to all participants. Thank you. Thanks very much, Susan. Uh, and thanks for the service on the RSI board. It's been it's been fun to work together. Um, okay, so our fourth panelist is uh, Shamit Kachru. He's a professor of physics, chair of the physics department, and director of the Institute for Theoretical Physics at Stanford University. Um, he's an alumnus of RSI 86, received his AB from Harvard and his PhD from Princeton. And his research uh, contributions uh, have been to our understanding of early universe cosmology, the mathematical aspects of black holes and novel highly quantum behaviors of electrons in metals. Um, he's, uh, he was recognized with a Sloan Fellowship, a Packard Fellowship, and a Simons Investigator Award. So Shamit, over to you. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so as Michael mentioned, I attended the Research Science Institute in 1986. Uh, I did the calculation last night. That's now 34 years ago, which is quite a long time. And the perspective that that time has given me really casts three aspects of my RSI experience in sharpest relief, so I'll talk about those. Uh, first and foremost, and I think this goes for everyone who's attended, I met amazingly talented people from across the country and actually the whole world that summer, 17 of the students um, actually came from abroad. Now, for young scientists, it's hard to overstate the importance of, at a young age, having a laser-like and intense focus on some one set of problems or set of techniques that, that you can use to attack problems of interest. And you know, an important part of that is played by having the right peer group. So I met at RSI, uh, among many others, a friend who had joined me at Harvard and with whom for three years I'd attacked most of the undergraduate and graduate curriculum in theoretical physics, and also the very beginnings of string theory, which at that time was sort of beyond the graduate curriculum and was for many years my research focus. But beyond him, I also met a broad variety of other gifted young scientists whose achievements in all kinds of fields, math, computer science, biology, really inspired me in the years to come and helped develop my further research interests. I remember in particular uh, another experience from RSI that summer, um, an article brought to my attention by a fellow student who later became one of the trustees of the Center for Excellence in Education. Um, it was about sensitive experiments being done then um, that claimed that the gravitational force between two point masses deviated ever so slightly from Newton's law, it wasn't quite inverse square law. Now, these experiments were eventually disproven, they were debugged, but in the meantime, the set of articles sort of fostered my interest in the, the possibility of new forces beyond those presently known, unification of the known forces, um, and generally the physics of the fundamental interactions, and these were directions that I would pursue sort of single-mindedly for the next 25 years. The third aspect of the experience that, that is with me and that is particularly relevant today um, is the emphasis on science in service of both the nation and humanity. So that summer, that was 1986, the terrible events at Chernobyl in Russia were still in the very recent past. And we had many spirited discussions and expert guest lectures focused on nuclear energy, of course, the nuclear Navy because of Admiral Rickover and the importance of fundamental science in the nation's service. The importance of broadly training scientists and citizenry to understand, grapple with and ultimately conquer 
scientific challenges like those posed by our current pandemic um, confront me daily in my roles at Stanford. And I'm happy to say I got an early start thinking about these kinds of issues courtesy of the Center for Excellence in Education. So uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks very much. Uh, and thanks to all of you for uh, sort of getting us all started here. Um, I have a few questions, maybe to prompt a little bit of discussion. So, and, and I'll leave it to the audience to determine what, if any, order I'm asking these in, what the secret code is. Um, so let's see, Susan, I'm gonna start with you, if that's okay. Um, you talked sure. a little bit about, about um, your RSI experience and how it shaped both your career and the associates you have with you. Um, can I ask you to talk a little bit as a trustee about how do you think about CEE and RSI now in particular uh, versus when you were there, the importance to the country, the importance to students and the importance to science? I think when I was a camper at RSI, it was just an overwhelming experience. You're literally drinking from a fire hose for six weeks. You are laser focused on getting your research done, you know, getting to know this slate of incredible people who all have diverse interests and who are from all over the place. Um, and, uh, and, and at the same time, it was my first exposure to um, all of these wonderful scientists who are doing cutting edge research, who are giving speeches and lectures every evening. Um, and then overarching all of that, you'd have trustees coming and you'd have Mrs. D giving speeches every evening. Um, and so honestly, when I was a camper, I, you know, I didn't think about the bigger picture with respect to um, RSI and CE. I, I just sort of, it was a summer experience um, that was incredible. Um, but now I would say that as a trustee, um, I am shocked that in these 36 years of RSI, that there are still so few programs available um, to, to highly um, talented students who really are pushing the boundaries of STEM. Um, it, it's, you know, it's wonderful that RSI and CEE are still, I think, considered to be the premier science program for training um, and exposing high school juniors and seniors um, to further research. But there is a shocking lack of, I think, general interest. Um, and I think that given these times with COVID, I, I, I'm hopeful that, um, that others around the world realize how important basic research is to um, not only hope is solving this pandemic, but also other problems um, in the world. Um, and so I feel that, uh, you know, as we pound the pavement every single day to try to convince others that um, the center and RSI are programs worth supporting, um, that, uh, that people realize how difficult it is to, um, you know, to, to spur the interest of others. Um, and I think it's, rather short-sighted um, not to realize um, how important programs like RSI are to this country. Thank you, Susan. And, and I'll just remind everybody that, you know, the, the board of CEE plays an incredibly important role of supporting both the leadership and the students in the programs. And the fact that the board contains so many uh, people who have gone through either RSI or USABO I think it's a real testament to the power that the organization has instilled in people and the loyalty. Um, Susan's a great example of that and, and all she's doing is really helping not, not only the continued support but the, but the financial health and well-being of the organization. So thanks Susan very much. Um, Christopher, so can you talk a little bit about the, the research work you're doing now at Washington and maybe in the context of Sort of how is it shaping what you think you might want to do after uh, after being an undergraduate? And I say that fully recognizing you just spent one year as an undergraduate. So if you could talk a little bit about that, that'd be terrific. Yeah, so um, I actually kind of got into the research lab that I did a little bit by chance because when I was um, visiting Washington University one weekend, uh, I wanted to um, 
to sit in on a, a biology class and, and see what the teaching was like. Um, and the, the one class that kind of stood out to me and was available in the time frame that I was there um, was a class on, on biological clocks and circadian rhythms. And so I, um, I sat in on the class, I spoke with the professor, and then finally when I came as an undergrad, I, you know, I talked to him um, and he offered me a, a position um, kind of analyzing um, actigraphy data. So actigraphy is they, um, we give patients these, these watches um, and it tracks kind of the wrist movements and that's used as a, a proxy for um, whether or not they're asleep or awake and you know how much activity they're expressing. And so uh, we are, um, you know, we're giving that to a bunch of uh, glioblastoma patients, um, which is a, a brain cancer. Uh, and there's a, there's a drug for uh, glioblastoma that um, we hypothesize acts differently whether or not you give it in the morning or in the evening. Um, and so uh, we have some preliminary data suggests that it might be uh, more effective if you administer it in the evening than in the, the morning. And this is a really interesting finding because typically, um, you know, physicians, when they prescribe medications, a lot of the time they don't really, um, you know, say like take it in the morning or take it in the evening. They say take it, take it once a day and, you know, the patient kind of just takes it at some time of day. Um, the circadian effects usually aren't considered. And so we actually given that most of the cells in the body actually do express circadian um, circadian rhythms in their, their genes and proteins, we imagine that there are actually lots of drugs that would have this effect. Um, and so this is kind of a, um, kind of a, you know, breaking new ground in this field of what we call chronotherapy. Um, and so what, what I've been doing a lot this, uh, this year is analyzing a lot of patient data that we've gotten from patients um, that the lab has collected data from in years past um, and so we have, you know, several years worth of data and I've been kind of going through that computationally, um, you know, st uh, statistically trying to fig figure out, um, you know, is there a difference between patients who take it in the morning or in the evening? And, you know, it's a long project because we have to um, watch the patients over a year at least. Um, unfortunately, they typically don't, um, don't live very long after diagnosis, um, which is also why this is such an important, um, you know, matter because it's, it's even though the average um, length of survival after diagnosis may be only a year. It's possible um, from, from a results that maybe giving it at the right time of day could extend their lifespan by maybe even another year um, or, or several. Um, so it's, it's incredible. Um, and how it's influenced, um, you know, my kind of what I want to do uh, after being an undergrad. Um, I would say that's, that's definitely a very hard thing to say because I've um, you know, I've been in flux as to what I, I really do want to do um, after being an undergrad. Um, you know, I came in as a, as a pre-med student and now I'm kind of, then I, then I decided to, you know, pursue a, um, you know, go to grad school in neuroscience research possibly. Now I'm kind of, I'm kind of between the fences or maybe even considering whether or not there's, um, you know, something else that I'd like to study altogether. And that's not to say that um, I don't really like the, the, um, the research that I'm doing, but I, I do want to explore my options a bit. So yeah, um, it's, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot uh, in my future that I really don't know, but I'm really excited to be working in this lab and to see where it takes me. It's terrific and, and really fascinating work, Christopher. I, I would only say personally to you, you must be the only rising sophomore in the country who doesn't know exactly what they want to do next. So. Don't worry that you're a little confused at the moment. So, Thank you. Uh, let's see, um, Rachel, we have two questions for you, uh, one of which came in from the audience. And so I would encourage the audience, if you have questions, um, to, to pose those. There's a QA and a box or you can put them in the chat box. Um, our question from the audience is, I understand uh, Rachel wants to be an aerospace engineer and that she may be an intern at a DOD lab. Can you talk a little bit about how you decided on that? Yes, absolutely. So um, my research at RSI um, and for the past six years actually has all been revolving around aerospace and aeronautical technology. Um, and that all kind of started for me uh, with a really weird instance I had. I was actually flying on an airplane and I looked out the window and I saw giant white streaks moving over the wings. And I was like, oh my God, we're gonna die. I don't know what that is, but we're gonna die. Like, that's not good. Um, turns out it was just condensation in the air. Um, and it's sort of that idea that I had no idea how planes even flew. That's what really got me interested in aerospace engineering in the first place. 
Now, I've always been an engineer. I've always loved understanding how things work and, you know, creating new things um, with my dad and my sister and my family in my basement. But that idea of well, how do planes actually fly? You know, like a kid, I think a lot of people just think, you know, it's magic. Something's happening, but we don't really know why. Um, and I was really interested in, in really understanding why. So I actually built my own uh, wind tunnel in my basement and uh, I just started tinkering around and finding new interesting things to understand about the world. Um, along the way, I actually invented my own aircraft wing that uh, uses uh, simply high speed air ejected on the wingtip to improve the efficiency of that aircraft by up to 26%. So that is incredible improvement, uh, not only for the cost of flying, uh, but also in reducing carbon dioxide emissions and even saving lives. And I've actually specifically focused that research on uh, military aircraft, specifically um, what are called STAL, so short takeoff and landing aircraft. These are aircraft that are on um, you know, aircraft carriers, things like that. Um, and they cannot benefit from a lot of the normal improvements that we have today. That's where my invention sort of comes in and um, improves that. So that is really where I got my interest in both aerospace engineering as well as the Department of Defense. Um, this summer, I'm actually going to be, like the question said, an intern at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base at the Air Force Research Laboratory, an internship that was actually um, created and brought to my attention from CEE itself and their partnership with DOD. And I'm so excited. It is exactly what I want to do. Um, and just being able to serve others um, in this in this specialty, that's what really makes me very fall good. in love with it. That's terrific. Thank you very much. Um, I do have one other question for you real quickly. Uh, so you made the switch from the one side to the other, from being a participant, a camper, to a counselor. So my question is, did you know all the places to look where students might be causing mischief? <laughs> oh, wow, that's, that's a good question. Um, so... My main difference uh, between uh, being a, a student of Rickoid, as we call them, and being a counselor is actually having that community. And like I spoke about before, when I was a Rickoid myself, I was a very shy person going in, like a lot of people are going into RSI. So I really, we have these counselor groups at RSI, you know, 14 people, and those are my closest friends my year. Um, and we did everything together. When I was a counselor, I had that same bond with my students, but I also realized that everyone there, all of us together, we have so much to, you know, learn and grow from one another. So I spent a lot of time not only with my students, but with everyone in the program, and also with other people at um, MIT, because that's where RSI is, um, is housed and is, is all the internships are. So um, I was able to learn a lot more my second year um, by being able to talk to people as an incoming freshman. I was going to Harvard at the time, but still being in that area um, and, and learn so much and meet new people. And that's really what I, I enjoyed being a counselor so much because I got to learn so much. And yes, I did know uh, a couple places to look, including the tunnels underneath the MIT um, and maybe even the roof of Baker, but we'll see about that next year. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Shamit, I have sort of a, what I maybe apologize, but maybe a bit of a personal question for you. So, um, you know, the, the country and CEE as part of it have sort of ridden this wave of the country being a real magnet for international talent, uh, international talent coming to the United States, pursuing careers and making incredible contributions to the research and technology ecosystem of the country. Can you talk a little bit about how that's factored into your journey, your personal journey to, to the career you've had? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Michael. Thank you. Um, that subject has real personal significance for me. Um, to start with, my parents were both immigrants to the United States. My father came from Kashmir and my mother from Maharashtra, both in India. And they were recruited here by a big state university in Illinois um, on the basis of their talents in linguistics, which is the study of the nature of language. And uh, I have to say their positions here in a Midwestern university town gave me just enormous opportunities 
Um, growing up in an American university town in the 80s was the ideal place to learn all kinds of things about science and mathematics. And then later, as I progressed in my career in theoretical physics, it, it struck me that essentially all of my most important collaborations and learning experiences have been, one way or another, um, involving immigrants to the U.S. from, from a really wide diversity of countries, um, some of which would surprise you. For instance, my most formative undergraduate and, and postdoctoral experiences were with an immigrant to the U.S. from Iran. Um, my most important paper as a, as a you know, faculty member at Stanford was written with two immigrants from the former Soviet Union. I've had crucial collaborations with people from India. And the ability of the United States to attract these really extraordinarily gifted people, um, and also its openness to doing so. You know, the U.S. is a great place, but it's been open to attract these people from abroad. These were absolutely crucial to both the scientific progress of my own, you know, research, but also, frankly, that of, of many American physicists of my generation. And, uh, you know, I should close by saying I do worry that we're in an era now of increasing sort of um, concern about globalization, limits on immigration. And... I'm concerned we might be endangering our status as this sort of premier worldwide destination for the gifted young scientists. And you know, America has 300 million people. We generate lots of young talent, but the world has 7 billion. And we want to attract people you know, from, from all those places. So in my opinion, it would be a really serious mistake to, to change that, you know, that nature of America as a magnet. Great, thank you, thanks. Um, let's see, a couple of questions have come in from the audience. Uh, Susan, a specific question for you. Uh, Mia asks, can you speak a little bit more about your experiences and work at the Carlisle Group? Sure. Um, I started working at the Carlisle Group in 1997, a year out from graduating from college. Um, uh, I had the experience um, from my summer internship, but that was two, two and a half months. Um, and I would say that what I learned over my 10-year career at Carlisle, so, you know, when I started, I was an analyst um, and my job was primarily to perform the financial analyses that the team would use um, as the basis for making decisions about investments. Um, now I worked in various industry groups over those 10 years. I worked in consumer products, in retail, um, aerospace and defense and telecommunications. Um, and so, you know, when I started out, it really was, um, you know, quite quantitative, not like, um, you know, it, it was not like quantitative trading, which actually I did spend one summer doing that as well. Um, but still, I mean, you really needed to have um, a, uh, a strong quantitative background um, to do the job that I did. As I grew more senior in the organization, what you realize is that in the investing world, um, certainly from the perspective of private equity, where, where we're not tracking micro changes in the market and trying to exploit those. As you evaluate businesses and industries, you realize that the quantitative aspect is just one very important part of making your decision. And so I would say that over the next 10 years, um, you know, from a professional perspective, my job was to learn how to evaluate management teams. Um, and then, you know, sometimes, um, no matter how great a management team is, and no matter how great financials look, there are simply certain industries um, and certain types of companies within industries where you're never going to be able to make a great investment. And so identifying the key factors, I would say, you know, the three or four major factors that will make or break an investment, um, that is what is um, the skill that is uh, difficult to hone and learn over many years in investing. I'll also say that um, one of my greatest uh, takeaways from my time at Carlisle um, was the amazing people who I had the opportunity to work with. And um, I directly reported to, um, for many, many years, um, Jay Powell, who is now the chairman of the Fed. Um, and, uh, and so there were, and, and there were others, including um, a very senior executive at Verizon um, and others who really helped shape my learning um, of how to invest. Thanks for your question, Mia. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see, I'm gonna take two more questions uh, and then I think we're gonna wrap it up. So Kent, just to, prep for you. So um, Peggy said, and I, I, anybody who wants to jump in, um, as people who love science and wish to promote it, 
Do you have any tips on how to spread that love and awareness locally? And especially wrapping in another question, especially right now in this time of the of pandemic and being at home. So any, any thoughts on how you're communicating uh, what science has meant to you and why it's important for everybody? Anybody want to jump in? Uh, go yeah. ahead, Rachel. So for me, something that is really important and always has been um, is a specific um, facet of this question, which is involving women and young girls in STEM. And um, when I really um, experienced this firsthand um, in the aerospace field, 9% of all aerospace engineers are women, less than 5% of all pilots are women. And so we are living in a time where, yes, there's an immense amount of progress and there are so many more young girls getting involved in STEM, but we have still have so far to go. Um, and we are losing a lot of talent and people that could change the world by not um, offering welcoming or safe spaces for them to explore and to create. Luckily for me, I had a safe space and um, I had role models. Um, and I eventually had CEE and I had RSI to be um, an engineer, a girl and an engineer, and to really explore my passions. But for a lot of people, they don't have that. Um, and so I think that one of the most important things that we can all do is to be that role model for someone else, to share your story and to be proud of the work that you're putting forth. And I, I think that's something that I really try to keep um, at the forefront of what I do on a daily basis. Um, because I know that when I was a young girl, I was looking up to people who uh, were doing international um, you know, science competitions, who were going to professional schools and things like that. And I looked up to them. And so for me, I actually started my own um, girls in STEM club at my high school uh, with a friend of mine and we do outreach in the community. And really that's what, that's what, what creates and fosters innovation. Um, being there and creating a space for people to explore because who doesn't love to explore and learn new things? Great. Anybody else want to offer anything? Uh, Christopher. Yeah, so um, I will, uh, that's, a, that's a great answer, Rachel, and I want to add um, some more to that. Um, Washington University, um, particularly, you know, um, we're in St. Louis in the, you know, near the city, so there are a lot of schools um, with students and, you know, a lot of schools uh, that don't have as much funding or a lot of students who uh, haven't been as privileged as a lot of the the undergraduates at, at WashU. Um, so a really big focus of the STEM community here at WashU is, uh, you know, outreach and exposing um, children to kind of science, um, you know, from a, from a young age so that they can really understand um, what it is and, you know, get a taste of the, the excitement that it can bring. Um, because I know that, um, you know, there are a lot of students um, in the schools who kind of don't really um, understand that much um, like what like what um, science is or uh, you know I've, I've personally seen students that like don't know what a scientist does or say like I, I can't be a scientist that's too like, that's too hard or something um, and well like I'm part of a, a neuroscience outreach club and what we do is we go to schools and we visit um, and we, you know, show them lots of demos and uh, teach them things. We, a lot of times we bring like human brains, um, which is always really interesting to them. And we uh, talk to them about, you know, the different parts of the brain, um, you know, what, um, what neuroscience is. Uh, and I think that that really does help um, bring people into STEM, even if, you know, even if that convinces one person in the classroom to, to become a scientist, I think that's, it's an amazing, um, amazing uh, thing to do uh, because, we, these people really, like, people really need to, to kind of see um, what science is. Um, and I think that's the, the main thing is that um, show science to kids, um, especially in schools, um, especially, you know, in kind of more local places or um, places that might not otherwise have as much opportunity to um, show science to kids. And I think that will make a world difference for them. Thanks, Chris. Um, last question, and I'm going to maybe direct this at Shamit and Susan, just because you've been out a little bit longer. Um, the question really is about, and Susan, you talked a little bit about this. Um, obviously, you had an experience in your RSI class, but can you talk a little bit about whether that network has stayed together for you, whether those folks have maintained, you've maintained connection or contact, um, and what, if anything, that's meant during your, either your career or your personal life? Um, Shamit, do you want to offer anything? 
Yeah, let me let me start by commenting. So uh, there were really tight connections I maintained all the way through undergrad and grad school. You know, I, I happened to go to Harvard and it felt like 60% of my class at RSI was there and, and you know, another 30% was at MIT. I saw those people all the time. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, one of my crucial experiences was having a cohort, especially a couple of other people who were as intense as I was about math and physics. And we really worked, I, I wouldn't say worked together so much as inspired each other through undergrad. Uh, in grad school, I met others who I first, you know, encountered through CEE uh, in grad school at Princeton. And, uh, you know, again, they inspired and broadened me. Later on, you know, I've had such a wide variety of experiences with, with RSI graduates, including uh, one of my own graduate students uh, was actually a former RSI student and she got her PhD with me in, in 2014 and is now a professor in her own right of math and physics. So uh, I've had connections ranging from, you know, elders to look up to, to students who I get to train who, who had benefited from the RSI experience. Okay. Susan? So Michael, to answer your question, um, uh, you know, what, what's amazing to me about RSI is um, the, the, the relationships that I've made with people outside of my class um, at RSI. So, um, you know, I think that uh, certainly more recently there have been more Rickoids interested in going into the financial um, arena. And certainly um, I've received many phone calls from, um, uh, from alum who are interested in talking about my experience, um, not only at Carlisle, but in, um, in trading and in, in investing and, and also um, looking for career advice um, in terms of how to navigate the world and the space. Um, I, I would say, um, you know, I, I, I was kind of on the front end in terms of private equity. So in terms of just direct colleagues, not that many. I didn't run into that many. Um, but there are a couple Bruce Haggerty's at Blackstone, um, um, and there are others. Um, what I would say is, um, you know, the network, um, some of it very deep, some of it more broad, uh, has been much more personal. Um, and when my dad was diagnosed with cancer, you know, I'd never dealt with cancer before in my family. Um, I didn't know much about the disease. Um, there are many, many Rickoid alums who are doing research in cancer, who are oncologists themselves, who do a lot of research. Um, and, you know, literally within four or five hours, I was speaking to everyone I could get my hands on. As it turns out, one of my counselors at RSI, um, her, she's an MD, PhD at Sloan Kettering, um, working in the same department um, that, uh, that um, that my dad needed for treatment. Um, and, and then I would literally, you know, Maite would put me in touch with people who she knew were um, working on cancer. And, you know, I would send out a random shout out email to people I didn't even know, and I would receive responses almost instantly. Um, so, so I would say that, you know, there were professional relationships that were maintained, but really the personal ones are the ones that are most important to me um, and also uh, serving on the board with so many of my alumni friends um, has been so rewarding. Very good. Well, three, three things uh, as we wrap up here. So first of all, uh, an apology to those of you who uh, offered questions that we couldn't get to. We're gonna move on here to Kent in just a second. So thanks to the uh, audience for the good participation. Thanks to the panelists uh, for giving of your time um, for the panel, but also for everything you're doing for RSI and, and for uh, for helping everybody understand the value of CEE, uh, RSI, USABO, and the real reason we're here. Uh, and finally, to the audience, I would simply um, commend to you uh, the reason CEE and RSI exist. You listen to these four people and you hear about their, those of you who are starting their careers and those, those are who are mid-career, and you understand, I hope, the value of what this amazing program has done um, and the support of all of you on the audience to make that reality happen and continue to happen is something we are enormously grateful for. So to, uh, to Chris and Shamit and Susan and Rachel, thank you very much. Um, and to the audience, thanks for, thanks for being a part of this part. And with that, I'm going to turn the podium over to Kent Churchill, who's going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, the trivia contest. Um, so Kent, over to you. Great. Thank you. All right, so the purpose of today's trivia was to find uh, something or uh, Admiral Rickover trivia questions that couldn't be Googled. 
and uh, spent a lot of time digging through other alumni, things like that, to, to try to find questions. Uh, a total of 48 people have responded, and uh, the winner took me by surprise. Of course, he cheated. Uh, I'll go through each question and then announce the winner. Um, should have known better when I was doing the questions who might be answering. So the first question, what food did the Admiral like to eat after every lunch most afternoons? The answer was chocolate bars. So again, that's a tough one to Google. What was the subject of the Admiral, the bulk of the Admiral's commercially published books? Uh, question, nuclear power, education, naval engineering, construction. Education, I've read all of Admiral's published books and there's a central theme and it is exactly why he founded the center. What was the year, make, and model of the only car the Admiral ever owned? Uh, 1983 Ford Crown Victoria. That was an obscure one. What city did the Admiral retire to? Uh, Arlington, Virginia. Who was supposed to be the first non-American permitted to go to sea aboard the Nautilus as a guest of the Chief of Naval Operations, the most senior uh, commissioned officer? and who was also Admiral Rickover's boss, before the Admiral decided against it and overruled the Chief of Naval Operations, so the top Admiral. Uh, it was, when the Nautilus came out, it was a super secret weapon, uh, and allowing a non-American citizen to ride it was unbelievably, it was a, an incredibly large deal. And so the Admiral decided that uh, the first, the British first sea lord, Admiral Mountbatten, was not going to ride on his submarine, and he didn't. The loss of the Thresher and the Scorpion uh, back in the 1960s and the subsequent investigations prompted the Admiral to later investigate the loss of which other naval warship? That would be the USS Maine. And uh, he published a book on it in uh, 1976 on the actual causes of loss of the Maine. It's a fascinating book. What was the top priority of nuclear power school? And I reached out to some uh, Rickoids who are nuclear power officers, and they came back with the, the same answer that you'll read in any book uh, or any subject on naval reactors. Safety, of course, is the correct answer. How did, the Admiral, how did Admiral Rickover's adversaries most often describe him? A totalitarian mini-state. In fact, the British described him as having a personality similar to the father of the British Navy, Admiral Jackie Fisher very similar approaches towards getting uh, their programs uh, from concept into reality. Admiral Rickover once described a former Naval uh, Secretary of the Navy as several interesting descriptions. A big fool would be the answer. I suspect he had more colorful words than that, but the official version is a big fool. Favorite one-liner uh, Admiral Rickover quotes, you can't go to heaven if you die dumb, a room without books is like a house without windows. Best to remain quiet if you're not operating on all batteries. Turns out all of those were correct. He also had some other ones that uh, the 84 and 85 alumni remember very well from when the Admiral would talk to them uh, in the evenings before every speaker. Mark Kenerwitz shared a couple of those with me. Hey, Mark, I was trying to reach out to you earlier. Talk to everybody instead. All right, the first civilian nuclear um, power plant or power station in 1957 was located where? That's an easily Googled one, uh, Shipping Port, Pennsylvania. The Admiral or Admiral Rickover's closest ally in the U.S. Senate was which senator? Senator Henry Scoop Jackson. There's also a submarine named after him. He was such a uh, strong supporter of nuclear power. And then finally, Admiral Rickover received the Fermi Award in 1964 from which U.S. institution? The correct answer is the Atomic Energy Commission. So the winner of today's quiz was Admiral Inman. Admiral, good, didn't know you were online. No wonder you knew all the answers. Uh, and Admiral Inman got 11 out of the 13 uh, questions correct. Thank you. It is no surprise that Admiral Inman would be the awardee. Um, you know, it's interesting because one of the questions about um, Admiral Rickover investigating the loss of other warships, the USS Maine, it was Admiral Inman who helped with the research of, um, for Admiral Rickover to write that book. And Admiral Rickover spent the rest of his life as a strong admirer 
of Admiral Inman, who was also a chairman of CEE's Board of Trustees and served on the board for many years. Congratulations, Admiral Inman. You will be awarded a check for $100 <laughs> as our official winner. You know, today was an interesting day following our terrifically exciting panel of last week uh, that discussed the coronavirus with our alumni. Looking at last week's alumni and this week's alumni speak with you, you know, is, is so wonderful for all of us that have helped to nurture these students. And you've been able to see the product of CEE's work of 36 years. We take it so passionately to help students who have tremendous acumen and abilities in STEM to, to go on to careers of leadership. And many of the students that you have heard last week and this week would not have been able to go to a summer program if there had been a fee. And it's because of you helping us to be sustainable. And even in this challenging time that we will continue to nurture students cost-free and nurture teachers as well. And that is with your financial support. The student profiles of those that go through our program are testimony to our mission. Over 80% of our students attend public schools. Nearly all students are from middle-class families. Over 90% of our program participants remain in STEM-related careers. And we are so proud that the participation rate of females to males has grown to near parity. In 1984, when we, the first RSI was held, there were 11 females in the program, all of them in biology, um, uh, pursuing, wanting to pursue biology careers. And again, um, we knew we had a lot of work to do, but Throughout the history of the center, there are no extra points given to students for any criteria. The only criteria is academic demonstrated excellence. And yet, with no extra points on any level, we've almost reached parity. And the women have gone on, not just in biology, but wonderful careers in science and math. You're, you're invited to review our website about consideration for involvement with us. You can learn more about the Research Science Institute, the USA Biology Olympiad, the Teacher Enrichment Program for Less Advantaged teachers and students in rural and urban settings. That's at www.cee.org. Do please consider partnering, partnering your philanthropy with the center because we do need your help in this difficult time to keep our programs cost free to students and teachers. I apologize again for our glitches in technology, but I do hope you found parts of this event enjoyable and inf uh, informative. Be safe, be well, and over the Memorial Day weekend, remember to honor those who fought and died 
for our freedoms. Thank you to our board of trustees, my wonderful staff, and all of you for helping to keep the center on the straight and narrow and to continue its mission. Have a wonderful day.